Hey, Walter Souls back with more tips for the knife maker. Today we're making steel out of this dirt. So it's a little after eight o'clock in the morning and we've already got the smelter started right here. This big stack of stuff is called a smelter. We're gonna be taking iron ore and charcoal and turning it into steel. Now the steel that's gonna come out the bottom of this smelter will be very similar to what's produced uh, for the making of Japanese swords. And this process is something that's probably very similar to what somebody would have been doing, a swordsmith would have been doing a thousand years ago in Japan. Now they didn't have electric air blowers and all that sort of thing, but otherwise the basic chemistry, the basic process, the basic idea is exactly the same. Now I've done a couple videos about smelting steel in the past, so I don't want to cover too much of that same old ground. So today I'm going to give you a sense of what you're up against if you want to try this for yourself. So the basic idea here is that you start with an ore source, you heat it with charcoal, and ultimately produce a primitive form of steel, what the Japanese call tamahagane or tamahagane, depending on how you want to pronounce it. As you'll see, this steel is completely unusable as it comes out of the smelter, so that primitive steel is then further refined so you can actually use it to make a sword or knife. Here's what's involved. First, you have to build your smelter. In this case, the whole thing's made from rammed mortar. Super simple, it's just Portland and play sand formed inside an old hot water heater core. Now, I do want to emphasize that there is not just one way of doing this. This just happens to be the way that I do it. You can see Tamahagane made in Japan on a more or less industrial scale in this huge smelter called the Tatara, which is a horizontal smelter, very different from this, but the principle is the same. Whole bunch of videos about that on YouTube if you want to go check them out. But this thing is actually probably more like what you would have seen a thousand years ago in Japan. So far as we know, the Tatara approach is only about 500 years old or so. I guess I should mention that obviously you have to have some idea of what you're trying to accomplish here. There's not really much detailed information about how to do one of these things, so it really helps to watch somebody else. My friend Jesus Hernandez and I started doing this about 20 odd years ago, and we were able to watch Mike Blue and some other guys, I can't even remember who all we had a chance to watch do it. And, you know, that didn't answer every single question, but it gave us somewhere to start. You're seeing some pictures of me back when we first started doing this. And keep an eye on this little kid right here. That's my son, Jake. You'll see him later. It'll give you a sense of how long this has been going on. Anyway, air is forced through the smelter, so you have to have inlet pipes known as tuyeres. All the stuff has to be fabricated from scratch. In this case, just good old black iron plumbing pipe. And the smelter itself is basically a consumable, as you'll see later. You have to rebuild it each and every time you want to do a smelt. Total cost for this rebuild, really under 50 bucks, but it does take a day or so of back labor to get it done. Each section weighs about 125 pounds, so it's a little bit of work to get this thing put together. Real quick here guys, if you've been enjoying all the free content I've been offering on YouTube for the past 15 years and you want to give back to the channel, there's a way. It's called Patreon. All my Patreon supporters at any pledge level get plans to most of my builds, plus other bonuses for higher pledge levels, plus you get the good feeling of helping out the channel. So help us help you. Link in the cards and description. Thanks and now back to work. The next hurdle is your ore source. Quite a variety of possibilities. Over the years I've used various hematite and magnetite based pottery glaze media, used specular hematite from Canada, taconite from Minnesota, this stuff here, a magnetite ore from Pennsylvania, which my friend Eric Orris tracked down in one ton quantity through contacts he has in the steel business. We paid a grand for it, including shipping, plus there was a lot of driving on Eric's part. So this wasn't just something you order off Amazon. 
Now, the speed at which the ore takes up carbon is governed in part by particle size, so the grains are almost pea-sized of this ore that we're using. So I spent about three weeks running 100 pounds or so of ore through an abrasive tumbler to reduce the particle size. Enormous mess, quite a bit of labor, it used a hundred bucks worth of ball bearings, and it destroyed the Harbor Freight tumbler. So, you know, it's a hundred and something bucks for a replacement, plus all the time involved feeding the machine. The process also requires lump charcoal. Briquettes will not do. So I bought about 250 pounds of charcoal. Cost more or less a dollar a pound, so that's 250 bucks there. The charcoal has to be chopped because it comes out of the bag too coarse. My buddy Mark, who you might have seen me following as he bought a big blue power hammer on one of my videos last year, helped me with the whole smell. Thanks, Mark. Here we are chopping charcoal. Super fun. Good way to fill your nose with more black stuff than you can imagine. So that's a fair portion of all the prep work, which doesn't include all the air plumbing, which I more or less did years ago. But you have to, you know, kind of put it all together and debug it and all that stuff. While I'm mentioning expense, you want to track your temps. So I'm using a K-type pyrometer along with an Inconel probe that's capable of withstanding temperatures approaching 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The probe actually costs more than the little pyrometer does, but the whole rig will set you back in the neighborhood of, you know, a couple hundred bucks, depending on how much you cheap out on it. I measure temps well above the heart of the fire, because the heart of the fire is hot enough to melt Inconel. The whole rig has to be assembled, so that's another afternoon of work. Then, once you get the smelter set up, it's good practice to do a dry out, which I do using propane. In fact, you might notice at various points in the filming here that there's a propane tank attached to the rig, but that is only used for drying and preheating. It's not involved in the actual smelting itself. The heat for the smelt, entirely from burning charcoal. So, on the day of, we get out to the smelter at daybreak, starting a preheat process which consumes a good deal of charcoal as well as some propane. Once we reach the target heat, the team starts adding charcoal and ore, as well as some calcium carbonate flux. After that, it's just rinse and repeat, trying to keep the reaction steady and the smelter from melting itself into a pile of useless slag. So you're kind of regulating how much air you're putting in, when you're putting in charcoal and ore, and how much you put in, all that stuff. By the way, if after watching all this madness you're not dissuaded from ever trying it yourself, I will be doing a teaching smelt in a few months. My current plan is to have maybe a half day class or something like that on the theory of smelting and how you construct the smelter and all that on Friday and then run the smelt all day Saturday so you'd be able to watch you know, that whole thing. If you're interested, shoot me an email. You can find my contact info on my website waltersorrelsblades.com and down in the description. Now I should mention that some people assume that this is just a melting process, that it's like, you know, making clarified butter on a stove or something. It is not. This is a chemical reaction. So the ore source is composed of either Fe304 magnetite or Fe203 hematite. The oxidization of the charcoal is an exothermic reaction, fire in other words, uh, which is producing carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Now the carbon monoxide strips oxygen from the iron oxides producing carbon dioxide. That's an endothermic reaction, which is why you need all this heat, causing the iron atoms to remain in pure form. No oxygen anymore. So in turn, all those little bits of iron are going to coalesce into little drops, and those are going to descend through the smelter and then kind of pile up at the bottom. Now, carbon is soluble in molten iron, and so a certain small amount of carbon goes into solution in these droplets of iron. How much carbon is absorbed governs whether you get malleable iron or cast iron, neither of which is any good to a swordsmith, or steel, which is, and that's obviously what we're aiming for. A lot of variables play into how this works and 
what ends up coming out the bottom of the pipe. A lot of ways to screw it up. Toward the end of the day, we shut the smelter down and burn all the charcoal until we get to the bottom. Here Jake and I are taking the smelter apart, ultimately revealing the bloom in the bottom. Yep, same little kid who was helping with a smelt in one of the shots from 15 or 20 years ago. Now Mark and I beat the bloom out with a hammer. You really have to switch off when you're doing this because the radiant heat just starts to cook you after 30 seconds or so. And here's the bloom itself. So after about a week of work, and depending on how you do the accounting, maybe a thousand bucks or so of expense, we got 11 pounds of bloom. Now, if you think that's 11 pounds of usable steel, you would be incorrect. Some of the steel is not at all usable in the first place. It's too much carbon, too little, it's contaminated with sulfur or something. All kinds of things can potentially go wrong. So anyway, whatever is usable steel will then be forge welded and folded about a dozen times, during which time you lose about 75% of whatever material you started with. So obviously this means that you're only ending up with maybe a pound or so of useful sword steel by the time this is all over with. And that in turn, because a sword is more than a pound, means that a couple of smelts are required to make a sword like a katana. It's just an incredibly expensive, incredibly laborious process, but the result is something super cool. So that's why I do it. But let's face it, there's a pretty good argument that this is a completely ridiculous thing to do. Thanks for watching guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years, so I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com